Um, all right, everybody, uh, let's get started. So um, my name is Patrick Forscher. Um, I'm an associate director at the Basara Center for Behavioral Economics. Um, that's a nonprofit um, research and advisory um, center uh, headquartered in Nairobi. Um, so I, I wanted to give uh, just a little bit of context for the panel um, and um, introduce the, the panelists. Um, so uh, this intersection between meta science or meta research, uh, I'll use those terms interchangeably. Um, that is something in uh, development. That is something that um, uh, does not currently exist or is not currently recognized as an intersection. Um, and um, the reason why I think this might be um, a fruitful topic for um, uh, for both uh, disciplines, for both fields, um, has to do with my particular background. Um, so prior to uh, joining the Busara Center, um, I was uh, actually an academic. Um, I um, was very briefly for about two years, a professor of psychology um, at the University of Arkansas, actually. Um, and I got my graduate training at the start of um, what's now known as the replication crisis in psychology. Quite a time to get your your research training um, in a in an area that um, seems like it might be using methods that aren't as um, solid as, as we thought. Um, and that's what got me really interested in uh, what's now known as meta science or meta research, because I, I couldn't stop thinking about the question, well, if um, the, some of the methods that we're using aren't as solid as they seem, um, why is that? And how can we make them better? And how can we make um, the evidence that we're generating more reliable? Um, fast forward several years, and um, I, I've uh, long been interested in applied research using evidence to um, do some practical good. Um, and I found myself at the Pizarro Center um, using some of the very evidence that I had been generating um, back when I, I was a psychology professor. And this topic um, has not left my mind. Well, if well, I'm trying to use that evidence um, to do good for things like um, global development, alleviating poverty, um, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, isn't it an issue that some of this evidence might be might not be reliable? And how can we think about the intersection between some of the things that we've learned from the replication crisis and, um, uh, and global development and, and other spaces where the evidence is used? I, I've also noticed from my time at the Busara Center that there are some issues um, that are of huge focus in the development community um, that um, seem like meta science itself um, and the meta science movement could benefit from. Um, one, one of the most prominent issues has to do with research in the global south and the fact that um, the global south uh, is um, excluded from a lot of research conversations. Uh, and I think that's also true of um, the meta science movement. Um, so the purpose of the panel is to brainstorm or um, to try to think about this intersection between meta science and global development, um, or more broadly, um, policy efforts, um, and to try to think of, think about those intersections and where both fields could benefit from each other, because um, I think um, the benefits for each field um, uh, could be present. Um, so I'm going to be structuring this panel as um, a Q&A se session. Um, I have some prepared questions that I've uh, discussed with the panelists. Um, but um, as we go through the questions, um, this is going to be a you know a brainstorming session and a relatively unstructured conversation. I, I want to see where the conversation goes. So I, I really welcome any um, questions that you um, that you ask in the Q and A. And I, I'm hoping that this can be um, uh, a little bit participatory and that can help guide the conversation. Um, so uh, I'm going to um, ask the, the panelists to introduce themselves, and um, then we can get started with the, the questions. Um, let, let's start with Jason. Can you give a short introduction? Yeah, thanks, uh, Patrick, for the, uh, that great introduction and for organizing this. I'm really excited to hear what everyone thinks. Uh, I'm, I'm Jason. I uh, research and teach uh, primarily evidence law at the Australian National University. Uh, but my background before I went to law school was in psychology, and I kind of had the same experience as Patrick, where around that time kind of realized a lot of the evidence base for psychology 
wasn't that strong and the methods weren't that robust. And so now that I study evidence that's used by courts and policymakers, I'm trying to think about how to improve that and how to work with those people to be able to evaluate evidence uh, in a way that's more calibrated to the actual strength of the research behind it. Uh, thanks, Jason. Um, Nakubiano, how about you? Thanks, Patrick. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, and it's a pleasure to be sitting on this panel um, and having these conversations. Um, my name is Nakubiana Mungomba. I am at ID Insights in Zambia in particular. Um, and I work on the Dignity Initiative here at ID Insights. Uh, and we I guess are exploring how uh, development can be done better in a way which respects the dignity of the people that we wish to serve, but also how organizations um, can uphold the dignity of their participants in their research uh, work, but also within their organizations. So their staff um, and the way that they do things. Uh, yeah, I think that's it for now. Um, and looking forward to contributing. Thanks so much, Nakabiana. Um, uh, how about you, Tara? Great. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much to Patrick for organizing, and it's an honor to be here with the other panelists. Um, my name is Tara Slau. I'm an assistant professor of politics at New York University. Um, my research uh, sort of is along a number of streams that are relevant to this discussion, hopefully. Um, so I do applied research, including some um, experimental work in Latin America on political institutions, um, but sort of more towards the meta science uh, community uh, work, I sort of led a uh, prospectively harmonized uh, six site uh, experiment. Uh, one of the EGAP meta catas a couple years ago. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that, I think, in the QA. And then since I've been doing some more theoretical work on thinking about uh, what is external validity and how can we. Um, how can we evaluate it um, in ways that were inspired by that work? So I look forward to hearing uh, what all the other panelists say, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Tara. And um, finally, how about you, Joel? Hi, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joel. I'm really happy to be here today uh, to discuss the issue, the issues of meta science and development. Um, I'm a research specialist at Busara Center. I work with Patrick uh, within our meta research unit. Um, and specifically, I lead an agenda on ethical research. Uh, so what you're trying to do is to improve the experiences of our participants within the research ecosystem. And this means that um, we are trying to generate evidence and data around like how participants' perceptions with regard to ethics and how researchers can learn from that to improve uh, their projects and their designs. I'm happy to be here. I'm looking forward to a very fruitful discussion today. Yeah, thanks, Joel. Um, so I, I hope the attendees are noticing, uh, one, that we come from a wide variety of disciplines and backgrounds. Um, and uh, that's a, a theme that I hope to draw out a little bit. Two, um, that we come from a variety of institutions, um, not just universities, but um, also nonprofit research centers. And that's another theme that I, I think will come out of this. And three, um, of the specific aspects of research that we're trying to change or improve are also a bit different and um, also uh, perhaps a bit different from the traditional focus areas of meta science or meta research. Um, and that, that's a last theme that I, I think might come out of this discussion. Um, okay, so I, I'm gonna get to the questions and um, they're gonna be focused, uh, some on, some are more relevant to meta science as it is, and um, uh, some are, are more relevant to development and what's happening in development. And there are some questions that are related to the Global South as well. But I just wanna emphasize again, if you, the attendees, um, have questions that you want to pose to the panel, please do put them in the Q&A and I'll try to work those in as, as we're going through the, the various topics. So um, first question, um, 
meta science has had a lot of success in um, shining a light on issues, especially related to open science and reproducibility. Um, so, what would you, the the panelists, say are some blind spots of meta science, and how might um, interfacing with global developments help help address some of those blind spots? Uh, I'll I'll take anybody if you want to unmute yourself or raise your hand or whatever. Um, go ahead. Yeah, Jason. Oh, yeah. So um, I thought maybe I would start here just because um, I think I very strongly identify as a meta researcher. So I kind of maybe, um, have a bit of skin in the game here. Um, but the, uh, the, 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 the last decade of, of meta research, which uh, p- people have studied research practices for a long time, this is not this is not new, but there's been this real kind of spike in interest in it over the past ten years or so. Um, uh, it, 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 so, so there's been a lot of work lately, mostly quantitatively studying research practices. Uh, folks like the people who are organizing this, the Center for Open Science, have been really good about working with research communities uh, and trying to see if reforms to the research ecosystem are, are working. Um, but I think one thing that is and there's been some efforts to look at the generalizability of research findings like the uh, mini lab studies and now there's many you know everything like like, like many babies many every many uh, uh lots of projects studying samples in different uh communities but it's really been um, the majority have been communities in the global north and i think there's limited understanding of i think maybe tara will speak to this the external validity or generalizability of a lot of this research, despite this, this trend uh, towards meta research over the past, past decade. Great. Yeah, go ahead, Tara. Yeah, so um, thanks. I think, you know, in some sense in development economics and political science to a lesser extent, there maybe have been some more, you know, isolated efforts to do meta research or try to uh, replicate uh, experiments across con- uh, field experiments across context. So I think of sort of the multifaceted poverty alleviation project that sort of Banerjee et al. did. Um, and then that uh, in some sense inspired these meta kettas, which are through um, evidence and governance and politics. And so these are, as I said, um, prospectively harmonized sets of experiments on a given intervention, right? So to date, they've done them on um, pre-electoral information and political accountability, community policing, community monitoring of common pool resources, um, and tax formalization and compliance. So the idea there is if we implement a common treatment um, across contexts, and these are all in the global south, uh, do we see similar effects or not um, with sort of an eye to formal meta-analysis? Um, so that's sort of where I got started in this community working on two of the um, meta kettas, the community policing and com- uh, pool, uh, community monitoring of common pool resources. So I think in that sense, you know, those efforts have been really concentrated in the global south, at least within you know, econ and political science as disciplines. Um, and that's good. I think that, you know, we um, perhaps in these efforts jumped on an effort to sort of just get more data to do the study over and over again, without perhaps thinking about what structure was underpinning the exercise. So some of my work since the Medicata has been to think about like, how can we formally think about what external validity is and when can we evaluate it? When are we assuming external validity to estimate a quantity, right? And when is it something that we could actually test uh, with our methods? And so I think like um, that effort, the sort of external validity sort of as a theoretical concept is much more abstract and sort of outside the context of global development, um, right, because it should apply in the many lab studies, even if they're all in the global north in sort of any other study. Um, but I think it takes inspiration for, from things that, you know, I saw and others saw while like trying to do these projects across contexts. Um, so I think in that sense, you know, there are some links there, though, between you know, um, global development and meta science, uh, but they're sort of links that we need to study and problematize in new ways. Yeah, thanks, Tara. And I, I wonder if you could elaborate on that a, a little bit more. So um, are um, 
Are you aware of um, researchers in the Global South leading some of these um, uh, efforts to test external validity? Um, are we taking ideas from, um, say, um, researchers from African universities and testing whether they generalize outside of Africa? Uh, I just wonder if you could describe yeah. more about the problem that problematizing um, uh, comment that you made. So I would say that I think one of the weaknesses of the projects to date is, um, you know, with some exceptions, uh, most of the PIs have come from the global north, right? So the people who are implementing these projects, in some sense, a lot of the people who had the sort of context specific knowledge to about like what the intervention would look like are based in the global south. But those, you know, are not necessarily uh, people that have been credited on the ultimate you know, publications as researchers. And I think that that's sort of um, an important thing that we need to be thinking about, um, right? So um, for example, you know, in, I ran one of the constituent interventions in the community monitoring of common pool resources in the Peruvian Amazon. And so, you know, there's a lot of conceptualization in terms of thinking about what does community monitoring look like there? How does it need to be structured such that people are interested in doing it such that the monitors are not, you know, subject to violence? Um, and a lot of that came from, you know, leaders that came out of these uh, indigenous federations, for example. And so they contributed a lot to thinking about what the intervention should look like, how it should be structured, you know, and then we served as a liaison with sort of the broader uh, group that was doing that. Um, ultimately, where the role of sort of researcher and implementer falls, I think is an important question for a lot of development research, right? Um, and I think that other people on this panel will have good ideas. Um, and so I think, you know, we want to, I mean, ma many of us are motivated to study interventions that, you know, may help commun the communities that we work in, or hopefully could help communities like those we work in. Um, but like, it's certainly not our voices alone that are the ones that are um, relevant in terms of thinking about what it is that we're measuring, what, how, what treatments we're doing, how we're doing that. Um, and so hopefully we can have some broader discussion about those types of issues in this panel as well. Yeah, that's great, Tara. Um, and to tie this back to uh, your comment, Jason, I, I wonder if you could describe a little bit more um, just for the sake of the attendees, what are these many lab studies and what do they typically look like? And, and again, um, is it commonly the case that these are led by uh, someone from the global south or what could you just unpack your statement about the many lab studies a bit more right yeah i, I was i was, was realizing that i gave almost no context for that so, so thank you that's that, that's good moderating um and i think there's there's more of these now than i i know that i'm keeping track of but the like original ones were um i think not really necessarily geared towards testing generalizability or external validity, but um, just as a way to get more participants because there was um, a perception and it's true that lots of psychology studies are, are underpowered. So I think there'd be some sort of agreement or some sort of call for collaborators to test some important, you know, practically or theoretically, usually I think maybe theoretically, important finding in um in psychology and there's be a call to go out and you would say oh you know my lab can collect like like 80 people and i'd like to throw it in there and and they would all get some sort of contributorship or authorship um i think only many labs too set out to um expressly set out to see if um Possibly one reason for the failures of some studies to replicate was due to variance in sampling site um, and you know, possibly culture, geography, things like that. But it, it wasn't really well designed to do that. That was one of the I think, major criticisms of it. And to, and to your other point, um, these are almost, uh, you know, again, I'm not keeping up with a lot of them now, but the, like the original six were, I think, all led by you know, folks in North America. So, um, that might have something to do with what Tara was talking about. It, it brings in the PI's um, values and um, approaches and what they think is important to study, I suppose. Yeah, um, thanks, Jason. And um, I guess building on that point, 
um, in either these like um, crowdsource replication efforts or uh, meta analyses, uh, or just in the in the topic of formal meta science, um, are, are there any topics that you think um, should be focused on um, that have been ignored? Like, what would those topics be um, uh, that might be these uh, these blind spots? So some of my recent research is trying to think much more concretely or precisely about what the theoretical relationship between studies is when we do, when we try to accumulate evidence. So that means when we try to take a study and then do some type of, you know, direct or conceptual replication, or when we do sort of these big trials in which we're, you know, ultimately looking to meta analyze um, treatment effects across sites. Um, and so, you know, I think that often we have conflated sort of our, you know, statistical assumptions or estimators for what those theoretical properties that link the studies are. And so, you know, there are certainly statistical issues across this literature and sometimes pooling studies together can help on those things, right? So if we have underpowered studies, like Jason says, you know, pooling across studies can help us improve precision. Um, but that doesn't necessarily address whether studies are measuring common quantities or whether the quantities across, you know, um, experiments, for example, relate to each other. So when is it that the average treatment effect over in my experiment in Uganda is, you know, at all sort of comparable as a quantity or um, to an average treatment effect from Brazil, right? And if those quantities are just sort of totally different objects, it makes sort of probably little sense to either compare them formally or to then combine them in a meta-analysis. And so I think thinking out sort of more of the that theoretical relationship that underlies that before we get to our estimates uh, can help us understand when this type of meta-scientific endeavor can teach us something substantively about the policies we're studying or the problems we're seeking to address um, and when, you know, uh, it provides less value added. Yeah, thanks, Tara. Um, so moving uh, uh, a little bit towards the development side of things now. Um, so uh, as we were just describing, um, meta science has uh, focused a lot on replicability and evaluating the quality of evidence. Um, uh, what do the panelists think about um, the potential for those topics to uh, benefit development efforts? Um, should development efforts be focusing on replicability and, and quality of evidence and uh, what might the benefits be? Maybe I could jump in here. Um, first be to, to sort of also react or add on to uh, what Tara and Jason said um, around, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, sorry, yeah, so what they were saying around um, sort of replicating studies in different contexts um, and what, what some blind spots might be there. I think one thing which development can, or which meta science has sort of started doing well um, is, is the whole idea of open access and um, being able to, you know, share more openly um, in terms of the methods that have been used and the data that has been shared, which is something which isn't being done um, as much in, in the development space. Um, and that's definitely something that we can learn from um, meta science and start to do more of. Um, and then also Tara mentioned something about co-authorship um, and how sometimes these studies are led by PIs potentially from the global north um, working in contexts outside their, their, I guess, native space. Um, and one thing that we have thought about quite a bit as the Dignity Initiative event at ID Insight um, is the fact that there is such great value in understanding the context in which you are working. Um, and granted, a lot of the research that goes on does emanate from the global north and it is, it is people who 
have the resources or the, the ability to be able to conduct these research, um, these, re these activities in, in these contexts. But what we are also trying to emphasize is the fact that these activities should be done in a way that makes an effort to understand what the local context is um, and what the local situation is. So that might be by um, co-opting co-authors to work with um, the PI on these studies and they can add the value of the local context because it can be quite a nuanced um, experience to be able to understand exactly where things are different in Uganda compared to Brazil. So while the fundamentals might seem the same and you might think you're comparing apples and apples, um, you might actually be comparing apples and oranges without actually realizing it um, because you do not fully understand the context um, of the place that you're working in. So I know um, some journals have developed requirements uh, for anyone who is doing research to have a co-author from the space that they are going to be doing their research. Um, and I think this is a move in the right direction. Um, and it adds such value to, to the results that you would be getting from those contexts. Um, and beyond even just co-authors, it might also be a matter of understanding what the people you are working with actually want and what they need um, before you sort of come in and and um, conduct a, a, an initiative or research or whatever it might be without fully understanding whether this is useful for the people um, you are going to be working with. So understanding that these people should not just be there to provide information um, and you know, you're just getting data out of them, but also thinking about the value that you're adding, whether this is going to be useful for them. Um, and now I have forgotten the question that you just asked. Could you? No, I, I I love all of the threads that you um, drew out, and I want to um, pick up on a couple of them. Uh, sorry, Jason, did you have something you wanted to say first? Uh, well, sort of. Maybe it was what you were going to say. Um, and I don't want to put him on the spot, but um, I have to say that uh, Joel gave a, a, a keynote a talk at the last conference for Amos, which is the one of the sponsors of, of this this event um and uh it's it's i i still tell people about this talk to this day because it was exactly what you're talking about it was uh, kind of the shocking thing where the um uh it, it was it was one of the examples you used joel of some researchers came from the global north and they were perform, performing a study um i think maybe in kenya and they didn't understand the context at all and they just gave i don't want to tell your your your, your example but the, like they gave money to the local community without, um, with all these weird stipulations where they, they the people couldn't tell their friends where they got the money from, and it actually caused more problems than it than it. I'll I'll let you talk about this, Joel. Sorry, uh, if yeah, you want, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so, um, and I link it back to the question that uh, Patrick asked on like what development research could learn from. Um, meta research, um, and for me, I think it's about like open sharing, um, sharing of knowledge of whatever goes on uh, during a study, um, because uh, you know, going back to the example that uh, Jason was talking about, we have a lot of cash transfer studies that are happening in the global south, you know, and. In almost all cases, we usually have like problems that um, are associated with uh, cash transfers because um, it might seem that giving people money would would make them like really happy. Uh, but if you look at the global south and how people exist within society, uh, people do not exist as individuals. Like they live within a community, and if you as an individual get money from wherever you get it from without. Um, being able to properly explain like what's going on. Um, it's usually problematic, you know, and people could start associating bad things happening to the community uh, to you getting money from uh, like strangers who came to do a study in, in, the, in the area. And these things happen uh, 
more often than you can imagine, but they still keep happening. Um, and my theory is that like they do happen and they are rarely reported. You know, when some when you're publishing findings and uh, talking about the study, all these um, other things that happen during the study are rarely uh, talked about. Um, the, the trend has been like just focusing on the positive aspects of our study and we don't have a lot of information about the conditions under which uh, your intervention uh, was a success or, or a failure. And because of the lack of openness in terms of like about these issues, uh, people keep on doing the same mistakes over and over again and creating more problems than um, development. So, um, Development can borrow so much from like uh, meta research by being a little bit open about uh, whatever happens within an intervention so that like other people can know and avoid some issues that, um, that exist um, uh, when doing research. Thanks so much, Joel. I, and I, I want to follow up on a few more of these examples of a lack of contextualization because I think it can be hard to um, get your mind around what's happening unless you have a couple more examples. Um, so Nakibiana, uh, you brought up this topic in the first place. Do you have an example of uh, a project where that was hurt by a lack of contextualization or it can be a story that um, uh, you've heard? Um, would you mind um, fleshing that out a little bit more? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is a story. Um, where a, a piece of research or an intervention was carried out in, in I believe it was Zambia. Um, and some people had found that when you provide a community with, I think it was something like tomato seeds or something like that, and they plant the tomatoes and they grow them, they sell them, it can improve uh, livelihoods and it can improve like, you know, the way that you, the, yeah, the livelihoods of the people that are involved in the intervention. So they came in and um, provided these seeds for free to the people um, to say, oh, plant these. And once they burn, then you will be able to sell them at market and you'll have more cash to be able to, you know, spend on whatever you need. Um, and the people were a bit like, okay. Um, and of course they got the seeds, they planted them. Um, but before long, the, this community was based like near a river and for whatever reason, they were not planting any crops. They used to like have crops brought in all the time. Um, and so the, inter the intervention thought that if we provide them with seeds, then this should um, help them, you know, start growing stuff. What the researchers soon realized is that the reason that those people are not farmers, as it were, was because hippos would come in from the river and trample on the crops or eat the crops or whatever it is. And it was just not a productive venture to try and farm because if you try and fight a hippo, you will lose. Um, so that's, a, 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 it might sound like a bit of a silly story, but it is like an example of literally someone just swooping in and thinking, oh, here's a community which doesn't currently farm. Maybe their issue is that they don't have access to seed. We will provide the seed and that will, you know, help them start up without understanding the context that the reason that they do not farm is that there are other things which are outside their control. Um, so that's an example of, of a situation in which a little bit of um, even just asking the people without before you actually plan this whole study and you've already spent all this money and identified the site and just going in and starting your intervention, just asking the people why they don't do what they what you think they need to do and understanding what might be more useful. Um, yeah, that's just a little example I can provide. Thanks, Nakamiana. And um, the, the lack of contextualization can also show up in, in measurement. Um, uh, uh, Joel, do you have an example of uh, uh, a measure or even a, a manipulation, um, like in a lab experiment, that didn't work or was improved by contextualization? 
I don't have a specific example, but um, given um, that maybe the the Trier's social stress task um, from that that stress project that happened in Basara, do you do you know that one? Um. So, for some of the measures that um, I've been borrowed from the global north and applied in the global south. Um, so what usually happens is that like a measure is taken from a study that was done in the global north, uh, validated in the global north, and the only difference that is um, done in the global south is translating it to the local language. Um, and the problem is that um, different communities interpret concepts totally differently, you know? What could be interpreted as fair in America could be totally different as what uh, what could be interpreted as fair in a place like Nairobi or Kenya where I am right now. So when you, for example, take a scale that uh, measures yeah, maybe yeah. stress or something like what uh, Patrick said, um, and in African context, for something to be qualified as stress must be very extreme, you know, <laughs> like really uh, you're really, really um, unable to, to, to function, you know. And because some of these scales were validated in the global north, it could be give you a misleading measurement when you're trying to quantify uh, what, uh, what stress looks like within uh, maybe a community in the global, global south uh, because of like the different contexts and like how people interpret um, interpret some of uh, the concepts in um, in the in, in the social social sciences, if I may say. So yeah, we we have that problem of um, yeah, you might think that you're going to see something, but you don't see it, and not because um, you've done anything wrong. It's just that you haven't taken the time to um, understand like how people define this concept you're trying to measure and if you just like borrow a measure from the global north and just translate to the global south or whichever community you're working in doesn't always work well so we have cases of um um researchers not like finding significant results uh simply they expected like to see something but they didn't see it and and mostly is because of this shared, like different understanding of like concepts and like how they are defined within different uh, societies. Yeah, uh, that's a great answer. Um, for the specific case that I was thinking of, um, uh, maybe this is one that um, I just heard um, about the Pusara lab, um, where which is a, a attached to where we both work. Um, so the story goes that um, the um, uh, this was a task that was designed to stress the, our participants out. This is a uh, like a psychology research study, basically. Um, and uh, the way you stress the participants out um, is that um, you have them do a speech in front of a panel of, of judges dressed with in white lab coats. Um, and um, you know this has been used hundreds of times, mostly in the United States and Europe, um, and really well validated. But uh, when we tried to use this in Kenya, um, none of the, the Kenyan participants are stressed out because, um, well, if you haven't been to Kenya, Kenyans fucking love speeches. <laughs> uh, people are just giving speeches all the time. So it's not a stressful thing. Um, and the second problem was um, the most common um, person or role that people had seen with a white lab coat was a butcher. Um, butchers wear these white coats. So one of the participants from in the Pissarro lab said, um, why am I giving a, a job talk or a speech to a bunch of butchers? Like, what is this? Um, and I think this is a nice example of um, how those assumptions can creep in, in this case, in kind of a funny way, but um, in more serious ways as well. Um, I wanted to transition to uh, a question that we got um, on the Q&A. Um, so there's a strand of open science that is focused on trying to increase equity. Um, and um, uh, some examples of this are um, haven't necessarily worked all that well, but you know there are things like open access fees um, uh, and um, uh, efforts to share research data, which maybe add to the total cost of doing research because they 
require extra effort. Um, and uh, so the question is that um, uh, a lot of these movements have started in um, uh, high income countries. Um, so um, is there a role for meta research, especially maybe learning from development and um, modifying these kinds of um, uh, uh, open science movements, trying to increase equity? Um, and what might that role be? Anybody have a have a thought on that? Uh, yeah, I can say something if you want. Yeah, go for it. Uh, I think I think I mean it's a really good point because in some, at least in some ways, that's got to be right. In that, you know, I, I guess I suppose one of the um, things we're learning from meta research is that we need like larger sample sizes and like open access fees, those are expensive to get in a lot of situations. So that's it's true that if, if we're evaluating research based on the sample size, then it puts um, some people at a bit more of a disadvantage. Um, I suppose one thing just about the actual practice of meta research can be you know, if we're valuing meta research more itself, um, then it's uh, like the the grants I put in for meta research are often uh, I, I ask for less fewer funds, but less funds because um uh, it's a little bit sometimes it's a little more in inexpensive because it's often just just desk research when you're you know like like research assistants code papers and going through publications that that's a little bit less expensive than collecting data in the field. So, but then now that I'm thinking that the raises challenges that we've been talking about. Throughout, so um, I'm kind of going in circles here, um, but those are just some thoughts I had. This this is a little bit above my pay grades. I haven't been involved in these discussions, but I I mean I guess you know one thing that strikes me is like sort of these you know seemingly well intentioned reforms having perverse consequences on researchers from the global south. Like I wonder to the extent to which we need to. Um, increase representation of researchers uh, in these positions, uh, whether in the global south or researchers with access to fewer resources, even in the global north, right? We know there's a lot of inequality there um, in these discussions when we make these reforms, right? And so I wonder to the extent to which, you know, when we say open access is good, um, sort of that move is based on sort of the, you know, experience and, you know, opinion of people that are in sort of a relatively high resource position. And so increasing sort of equity or the number of voices in those discussions could help. The other thing is sort of to the extent that these are in principle good practices that may also have benefits for, you know, some researchers with fewer resources in the global south or otherwise, right, having access to journal articles that are not costing, you know, $30 each or being able to download data. I wonder the extent to which, you know, graduated fees based on sort of where a researcher is and what resources they have would be sort of, you know, a better uh, way to not have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. Um, but of course, these are, uh, you know, above my pay grade at this point. Yeah, I love that idea of graduated fees. Um, uh, this next question is, um, you know, it's carrying forward these themes and maybe gives you a chance to say more things. Um, so uh, meta science um, uh, to date has been pretty concentrated in the global north. Um, and I think the previous question um, reflects that and maybe picks on a specific aspect of that. Um, do you think that um, the meta science movement or the field uh, can uh, learn any lessons from um, the, the development community about the dangers of being so concentrated in the global north? And are there any strategies that the meta science movement could be thinking about to mitigate some of those dangers? Maybe I can jump in here to start. Um, <clears throat> I think the the lessons that that could potentially be learned 
um, biomedical science from from the development community is is firstly something that we've already discussed quite a bit in terms of um, the aspects of context and how that can how that can change um, your findings um, depending on where you're based or where you're conducting where you're conducting your research. Um, so I think development has internalized a little bit more perhaps um, the fact that that aspect about context and how that really matters um, when it comes to to conducting your when it comes to uh, validating your results and saying that they are comparable. Um, we are we are very hesitant to say that because we conducted, uh, you know, cash transfer program in this situation and it was wildly successful. That even if we moved to the next to another region in the same country or a neighboring country, that we would necessarily uh, get the same results. So I think that is that is something that. A first point that that can be learned, um, and then from that understanding that if most of the research is concentrated in the global north, you cannot generalize the findings to be a global representation. So while it might uh, hold true more broadly in the global north, you cannot assume that then those findings can be transplanted to other contexts, um, particularly uh, compared to situations in the global south. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll pause there for now and, and allow anyone else to jump in. Picking up on what Nakubiana says, like I think she's absolutely right about sort of context being really important, both to understanding why we might see effects or not, why something might be effective, and also how we interpret the effects that we see. I think one thing that's interesting and perhaps something that the development community needs to continue to think about, but is something interesting perhaps to meta science research more broadly is to the extent that a lot of these interventions that people do are some type of policy intervention, right? A conditional cash transfer, some type of community development or community monitoring program, whatever it is, um, right? Like a lot of researchers or at least their partners who are funding these things have a goal like to use this to inform policy more broadly. Right. So to get this in the hands of policymakers such that, you know, it's not just 40 treatment communities, but the government can, you know, scale this up. And I think that often we don't think enough about those issues of context, you know, both, you know, how communities might be different from each other or individuals might be different from each other, uh, but also like how the, you know, scale or identity of the implementer might matter for what effects we see, right, which has issues for scale up. So if my little NGO, I don't have an NGO, but, you know, is the one doing this program, right, and we have close relationships with the communities and we do all this, but then we want to go to the, you know, national government and tell them to do this, right, would we expect similar effects? And so I think that's beginning to be problematized um, in development. And we have some, you know, good examples of that. I think that that type of, you know, thinking about how evidence is used uh, can be useful for the meta science community and is ultimately a meta scientific question uh, more broadly, even for efforts conducted, you know, in the global North or on much more specific populations. Um, so that's sort of one place that I think both fields have a ways to go, but, uh, you know, could be in dialogue. Yeah, I, I love that you brought up this idea of um, how evidence is used. Um, so I wonder if we could uh, unpack that a little bit more. Um, uh, what are the intersections between meta science and development on this question of evidence use? And um, uh, what sorts of things do we um, know so far about evidence use? So I think that, you know, this is a field where we're, you know, learning, I think, you know, for example, one way that people might propose using sort of evidence is, you know, either on one hand, uh, you know, we use this small intervention in order to do sort of advocacy for a broader, you know, reform, right? So in, I did a project in Haiti where we were studying, you know, free legal aid for people who were illegally detained. Right. And this is a context where there was no public defender at the moment. So this was, you know, 
six or seven years ago. And the goal of using that evidence was to be used in advocacy to the Haitian government to actually create sort of a public defender's office, right? Um, and, you know, it was successful insofar as sort of legislation passed. There's sort of many other issues, um, you know, since and at the moment. Um, so like that's sort of one way that sort of organization, like aid organizations often use evidence. We could also think about targeting. So it may be the case that an intervention is effective only in some populations, like only for women or only in, you know, communities below immediate some income level, right? And, you know, if that is sort of a feature of the intervention that would persist into a different context, maybe we want to allocate that intervention to only women or to only communities below a certain income level, right? And so there's sort of different ways we can think about using evidence from a single, you know, study to, you know, change, you know, or address, you know, perceived social problems. Um, and so, you know, a lot of that, though, a lot of those are sort of conditioned on assumptions about how the context of the intervention would be similar, right, to Nakubiana's point, right? So, you know, if when my NGO does it, it has good effects for women, but when the government does it, there's no different differential effect for women and men, then like, you know, telling them to sort of target this uh, is, you know, uh, a harder question. And so we have some ideas about like using evidence in those ways that I think, you know, often come stem from uh, interventions and development that are sort of closely integrated with, you know, policy stakeholders. Um, I think that there's a lot of questions that we still don't know about sort of government's capacities to actually use or understand data right? Even sort of in the United States, we have the Evidence Act, which is trying to get, you know, federal agencies to run a lot more impact evaluations on their projects. And sort of just the capacity building to do that is a huge problem here, um, which presumably is the case in other countries. So I think that there's sort of a lot of open issues that we haven't studied very much there, um, but are, you know, relevant, even if we want to sort of use you know, a small intervention from psychology to inform, you know, uh, you know, to increase like response rates or some type of behavior on the margins um, that could be learned from this type of policy collaboration. Go ahead, Jason. Uh, yeah, one thing I wanted to jump in on there, the, the last thing that um, Tara mentioned is that one thing I've noticed uh, in a lot of contexts, but um, I'm thinking most right now of in Australia, where I've been most recently researching um, the the policymakers here. So, uh, on one body that I've looked at, the Australian Law Reform Commission, who makes um, recommendations to the government about how some some laws might change, they have so much um, discretion about what research they they pick and which one they focus on and which and what and what they rely on and for any given question you know sometimes there's dozens of studies on it and they can pick any one to be the one that they use to to, to guide their decision and uh, the same thing happens in courts where expert witnesses can can cherry pick evidence uh as much as they want really uh, like unless there's another expert there who can call them on that and it doesn't happen very often uh so there's, there's a real challenge of um how to make sure that these this is, these decision makers use the evidence that's or the research that's you know the most reliable or the most applicable to the context, um, and I haven't <laughs> been able to think of any good way uh, and, and it, um, to do that within the mechanisms that we have available here and, and that that my field uses. So I'd be very curious if there are you know, other fields represented this call or. You know, elsewhere that um have, have have better or fairer ways of doing that because it's it's a real challenge. And Jason, um, I wonder if you could uh, talk a, a little bit about um, uh, the quality of evidence and its um, how that factors into um, policy and law. Um, uh, do you have any opinions on that? Well, yeah, I mean, as I kind of. It, Hand waved at um, the the um, I think in so in I, I look at research in forensic science, which is a field that kind of produces evidence to be used to solve legal problems, but also criminology and psychology and law. And yeah, I think it's of very uneven quality. Um, 
and a lot of the indicators of that I consider indicators of quality that not not I'm sure that not everyone does. Um, the sample size and whether it was registered and if there was any outcome switching. I think those aren't really obvious things for a lot of people. So it's sometimes challenging to um, kind of encourage these bodies to take a look at those things. But then there's the there's much more serious issues that you know, folks here deal with. Like there just isn't applicable research on a, on a topic. So um, I don't know, I guess it goes from uh, too much bad research to just not enough research. Um, yeah. I, again, I'd be curious what, it, how people here deal with this, this problem. Yeah, it does. Uh, any, uh, go ahead, Nakapiana. Yeah, for sure. Um, so in a past life, I worked at a, at a um, think tank, uh, which worked on policy analysis and research directly with uh, the Zambian government. And I think evidence-based policymaking has, has become in some ways a bit of a, a buzz phrase uh, where we are or a lot of times we're, we're doing research in, in order to try and influence policy because we see that um, sort of as Katara alluded to, that is the way that we can have greater impacts or that is the perceived way that we can have greater impacts. Um, so going from our little experiment or a piece of research and saying that, okay, perhaps we can apply this to, to the general population. Um, so, in terms of how we can actually use evidence to influence uh, policy making or lawmaking, I think that is that is a a tenuous link because um, as Jason has mentioned, these policy makers will often cherry pick um, what is relevant to them, and what we as researchers need to understand is that they also have other factors that they have to consider. So the evidence might be solid and concrete, but they have um, political economy things to consider. Like there is, um, you know, politics that needs to be to be understood. There is, um, okay, will this affect my, you know, popularity scoring with the people? So it is not as as researchers, as people who are focused on evidence, we all, we often think that well, this is cut and dry. Why are you dragging your feet? But I have had experiences where you have generated the evidence, you have discussed it and presented it, and then that piece of research, that booklet or whatever it is, just goes and sits on a shelf and collects dust because at that time, um, the political will to implement is not there. Um, and what has sometimes proved to be more useful is building strong relationships um, with the policymakers and building a relationship of trust uh, with the policymakers to help them to slowly, I guess, um, convince them of the evidence, but also get their more personal buy-in. So if they have a greater conviction of the fact that, okay, this evidence actually needs to be acted upon, then this is something that I should push for despite the, the you know, politics and the, and the other um, factors that need to be considered. So unfortunately, um, it's I feel like it's not a straight link um, between evidence being produced and policy being influenced or changed. Um, but what I had, what I think is a place to start or one place to start is building those relationships of trust um, because yeah, as, as Jason mentioned, um, there there is a lot of cherry picking. And if we work with central institutions, so obviously this might be different in different countries, but more often than not, the government will have a, a think tank of some sort, which they um, trust, I suppose. So working with those types of institutions to help build those relationships, I think is something that could be useful. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Joel. Yeah, um, I agree with um, Nakubana about uh, building um, relationships of trust uh, with the government because, from my experience, the government or policymakers cherry pick 
they also cherry pick where to cherry pick you know um and for most of the evidence that has turned to anything uh, into a policy has been evidence that has been generated with uh, these policy makers as stakeholders in the generation process of uh, um, the evidence. So anything that they weren't involved in in any way, then like just becomes some other published uh, published work. And uh, for anything, any of the findings to like be translated into policy, we need, we need to find a way to um include these actors in the in the in, in the process uh, that is from my experience you know like uh, all the research projects that I've worked on that have been translated into policy I've had people from these policy think tanks being involved in one way or another and that's the only way I've seen evidence uh, turning into policy anything that they are not involved in um even beyond um interpreting evidence or using evidence, even like collecting the evidence itself, you know, if they are not involved in one way or another, it becomes really difficult to, to do it well and, and peacefully. So we have cases where, um, and it's because like nothing happens like outside the political, social and um, cultural dimensions, you know, um, and everything should be um, cognizant of, of this fact, you know, once you ignore those dimensions, then things like become really difficult, whether it's uh, the use of evidence or um, collecting the evidence itself, you know, like all these social cultural issues should be taken into, into account. Yeah, that's great. And maybe a follow up question for anybody on the panel, actually. Um, do you think that there's a role for uh, research on research or um, meta research to help understand more of the factors that creates the strong um, evidence to policy pipeline or how to strengthen that pipeline. Do you think that's that could be um, fruitful or do you have other ideas for how to understand this process better? I think so. Um, since right now we don't have that uh, framework for turning evidence into policy, um, I think major research could have um, some role to play in that. Um, we we know that there are things that need to check for evidence to be turned into policy, but right now we don't have a systematic way of doing it. You know, uh, if you have to um, collaborate with government actors or pol political think tanks, you know, like how do we do it in a way that is both um, useful uh, for researchers as well as uh, the policy makers in the sense that. Uh, to make sure that they don't influence like how you interpret your findings as well as uh, they find your findings useful, you know, uh, having that symbiotic relationship. So I think meta research could uh, generate some evidence around like how do we create a systematic framework of translating uh, research findings and evidence into actual policy that can be used. Thanks, Joel. Um, so uh, transitioning to a, a slightly different topic. Um, so uh, because this is about the intersection between meta science and um, global development, um, I, I think the that intersection can't be fully understood without bringing in issues around the, the global south, which has, has already been a topic of discussion for the panel. So I wonder if uh, someone could do a little bit of stage setting um, just to describe what are some of the um, uh, existing efforts within the Global South um, to improve research culture. That's a big focus on in meta science, but as we discussed, meta science is focused in the Global North primarily, um, but are there existing efforts um, uh, and what are they um, that are more focused on Global South issues? And um, maybe to lead you a little bit more, <laughs> um, uh, maybe like um, you could talk about some of the ethics issues or um, or dignity, any of that I think would be within scope. 
Yeah. I, I don't want to sort of monopolize this topic as sort of someone working in the global north, but I think, you know, I think one thing that we could, that we need to address better and has already been alluded to are sort of various issues of power, right? And these come in different ways. So some of this is in the context of, you know, we talked earlier about research collaborations, right? Like what type of credit or compensation is the appropriate, you know, um, device when we collaborate with, you know, whether they're researchers or activists or implementing partners working in the global South, like what is the right way to structure those relationships to ensure that those people have both, you know, maximal agency and also, you know, are, you know, compensated for, you know, the invaluable knowledge they provide. I think sort of the second piece of the power issue, right, is things about our questions about ethics. And I think, you know, there's sort of emerging literature, at least in like political science, trying to problematize these things, thinking about um, researcher positionality, thinking about, you know, how we should think about harms and benefits for the communities and individuals that we study. Um, and so I think that that's an emerging topic that we need to talk uh, more about. And then I think that like a third thing is, you know, we don't ideally like when we do research in the global south, it is, you know, not just fully an extractive activity. Right. Um, and I think that we have plenty of examples. I'm sure that there are better examples than I can provide about when that type of extraction has just happened. Somebody just comes in, does something, takes the data and run. So I think, you know, we can also think about ways to do, you know, capacity building, right, whether those are workshops, uh, or courses, or, you know, some type of more formal mentorship for researchers and people working in the field in the global south. I know there's some, you know, my experience with this is, you know, limited. I know, for example, when I was working with evidence and governance and politics, they do these learning days, which are like week long, you know, workshops on experimental methods for PIs in, you know, um, Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa, which I think are valuable with some follow on grants for independent research. So I think that's, you know, one model, but, you know, as at least when I think about this question as someone from the global North with probably many blind spots, you know, those sort of approaches to this power imbalance are things that I think are worth talking about. Go ahead, Nakapiano. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll springboard off some of the things which Tara mentioned um, when we're looking at understanding the people that we're working with um, or, you know, the people that we're trying to serve um, or making sure that research is, is not as extractive. Um, I think that is something that we as the Dignity Initiative at ID Insight um, are particularly interested in, um, in that we are, we want to find a way to do development work, development research, development interventions in a way that respects the people that we are trying to serve. So not treating them um, purely as, as, you know, subjects or, or numbers or quantities from which data can be extracted and then we proceed to, you know, uh, find our claim to fame, but treating them as humans who uh, we see their full humanity and their agency and um, finding ways to, to acknowledge and uphold their dignity. Um, one thing which comes to mind is the issue of consent. Um, I think in the in the global north, it's something that people are very are a lot more cognizant, I guess, of of the fact that when a consent form says that you can say no to this, um, you know, to us conducting this this interview or you can say no to providing this data, um, they're a lot more cognizant of their rights to be able to do that. Whereas in, in the global South, or maybe I'll speak more specifically for Africa or maybe even Zambia, um, there's a sense in which people do not fully understand or appreciate the agency that they have um, in being able to 
to guard their privacy, to guard their data and say no if they are they do feel uncomfortable. So a lot of times we find uh, situations where a researcher comes into a community and already there is that power imbalance because if it is an underprivileged community, if it is a remote community, um, the locals themselves might feel like, oh, this is for someone coming in from, you know, from abroad or from the city or whatever it might be. And therefore we must cater to whatever they need um, and provide them and be hospitable even um, because it is in our culture to be hospitable. So I think that is something that we need to, to be more cognizant of in the sense, in the, in the sense that um, we need to check ourselves as we do research. We need to be approaching uh, be approaching this these type of interventions in a way which doesn't say, oh, because we're going in and they're welcoming us, or because um, we feel like this intervention is going to be super impactful or um, whatever it may be, we, we should not be of the habit of just justifying uh, what we are doing because we think it is for the greater good. But seeing the people that we are working with as full humans who should be given the agency to decide whether they participate or not um, and whether this will be a valuable exercise or not. I will stop here because I could talk for the rest of the day um, and let other people jump in. Yeah, I can jump in here with um, um, what we are currently doing at Busara, which is sort of similar to what you're doing at the Dignity Project. So, um, yeah, the issue of ethics and how to conduct ethical research has been like really um, stood out in the last couple of years uh, in the development uh, sector. So, and what has been happening is that um, yeah, like for example, right now we are we are a panel of uh, researchers talking about these issues and some of the ways that we can ensure that these processes are are better. Uh, but one thing that has consistently been missing in this conversation is the participants themselves. You know how they define whatever thing that we want to to improve. For example, if you want to say that you want to improve fairness, you no. Know? Uh, how do they define fairness? What is fair to them? You know, uh, at the moment, I think what's happening is that um, even for for researchers and even the ethical review boards, uh, whatever guides the interpretation of these concepts is a framework that was developed in the 1970s, the Belmont principles, like what it means to be fair, what it means to be respectful, what it means to be just, and it was for even a different like, context, like clinical trials and not social sciences, which are totally like, sort of different. And since then, we've not had a framework that is that addresses um, current current issues and the context of social science. Um, and what we're trying to do at Busara is bringing in uh, participants into these conversations just to understand when you're saying that um, your research is fair, um, does it tick the boxes that participants care about uh, when it comes to fairness? Like what does fairness mean to them? If you want to, if you're saying that your research is just, like does it, th does that reflect what uh, participants uh, perceive as, as just? And I think that's one of uh, the issues that is facing um, this new initiative to ensure that our research processes are respectful and are ethical is that we are not involving the participants more like uh, to try and understand from their own perspective what they expect from from research and like what um, all these things mean to them. So uh, I think um, yeah, adding uh, participant voices in these conversations around like um, ethics and how to improve research is really critical. Like we've talked extensively here, context is very important. <laughs> so uh, you you could think that you're doing something really good. Uh, your uh, your research is really ethical, respectful, uh, fair. But 
from the participants perspective um they don't understand what you're doing and it's not valuable to them in any way uh, and whatever you're doing does not resonate to what they expect from from research uh, so yeah uh, researchers and all the stakeholders uh, including the voices of participants more in um debates about improving research in general uh, it should be something that should be done more uh, so that we can make sure that uh, all these stakeholders have shared meaning of concepts and they are on the same page at the end of the day otherwise uh, we'll have the same same problem where uh, researchers and experts sit down come up with solutions and when they try to implement them they don't resonate to what participants expect and then you're back again to the same 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 cycle uh, that's fantastic Joel and Nakabiana and to to unpack this some um, issue even more um what are those uh, some of those alternative procedures um what would they look like to involve the participant voice more and um since this is um a meta science or meta research conference um what are the um how did you figure out those procedures what was the research process like or the, the evidence gathering process like to develop those procedures? I can jump in here for, so um, I've been working with participants for the last eight to 10 years, you know, like um, implementing studies, collecting data from uh, participants and the same issues are always like prop up every time we, we go back to the field and, um, conduct research you know uh because and all of these studies have been vetted by ethical review boards they've been approved and everything checks on paper you know i uh, just uh, check again as to what um what the researchers did versus what they promised they'll do everything checks but by the end of the day um uh, participants are not satisfied with like how research is conducted they are always there are always com complaints about um researchers like doing this extractive sort of activity where you just come take data um disappear then come back again uh, later on um with with more questions uh, and a promise that findings will turn into evidence and that never comes to to <laughs> to life so um what we realize is that with that process happening again like research protocols being approved checking the ethics boxes and everything seeming fine on paper and still having the same issues crop up over and over again uh, made us realize uh, perhaps uh, the approach is wrong. We need to be involving the end recipients of this process like more and uh, trying to understand like what's their perceptions and what, um, in what ways do they think that researchers can do better. Um, we believe that they are experts in their own lives. They know what is fair, what is just what is so uh either that okay if you've tried um the frameworks that exist uh, of defining what is uh, ethical respectful and all that and still the issues keep on cropping up again probably we should turn like um our approach and start talking to the participants first and trying to understand like what they want and what how they perceive all these um uh ethical process, what an ethical process would look like. Um, and by doing that, um, you don't not only um, buy, find buying from participants and them engaging more in your, in your, in your research, um, you could also uh, help in the evidence generation process because right now, because of the current system that exists where researchers get data, go uh, interpret published findings and never come back to um, the participants to share the findings and sort of like uh, see whether they misinterpreted anything <laughs> in, the, in the process um, is something that um, could benefit from this approach where every decision that a researcher makes or um, anyone, any stockholder in the research ecosystem that eventually affects the participants, the solutions, and the information should be coming from the participants on how to improve these processes. Otherwise, we will keep on having the same, same issues over again. Like I've seen the last 10 years like of doing ethical research on paper 
and still having um, complaints from participants in terms of them not seeing the value of participating in research. To them, like it's not clear like why researchers do whatever they do because it never uh, resonates with them. That, that's fantastic, Joel. Um, so uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, I mentioned at the beginning of the panel that, you know, we're from different kinds of institutions. Um, uh, Joel Nakapiana and I are all from, uh, we're working at nonprofits. Um, so uh, more generally, um, just for the benefit of the um, uh, uh, viewers here, um, what do you see as the role of uh, non-academic researchers, people at nonprofit institutions like us in um, uh, Global South research, especially in improving research cultures? Um, and how do you think non-academic researchers can be better supported in, um, in their work? Um, maybe I'll start. Um, I think one difference maybe uh, between academic and non-academic researchers, um, particularly in the development space, um, is that in some ways non-academic researchers are maybe based in, more often based in the in the context where they are working, um, and we've already talked quite a bit about how context is is important, but also I think because we are often in those in those settings, um, we have a greater opportunity to look beyond um, the res just the results of, of the research that we're doing or just making sure that, you know, this research is rigorous and is, is producing, you know, replicable results or whatever it might be to acknowledging the the participants that we are working with as Joel has has just I mean yes Joel has just um, talked about quite a bit um, so because we are in these contexts sometimes it, there is the potential that we can um, better acknowledge the the participants that we are working with and therefore um, be a bit more, like go beyond the research and the rigor and the evidence to finding ways to action um, the the research that we that we have been conducting, um, and I think in some ways perhaps we can also play the role of advocacy that we spoke about a little bit um, when it comes to policy creation or yeah policy making. Um, so we straddle the line between generating that evidence and, and being the, the producers of that evidence to also be the people who can talk to the policy makers um, more directly in a bit of a dumped down way um, to, to say, okay, this is what a P, this is the P value, but to you, this is what it actually means. Um, and and yeah, maybe perhaps use more layman language um, to to make it a lot more accessible to the decision makers or the policy makers. Um, yeah, those are some initial thoughts about how how academic non academic researchers might might help the situation. Uh, that's great. Um, so I have uh, one final question before I. Um kind of try to give a wrap on the, the session. Uh, I think this is a nice one to end on. Um, so in, in what ways um, can or should uh, the tools and methodologies of meta science be um, adapted to better suit um, the needs of researchers, um, either in uh, nonprofit settings like us or generally who are doing work in the global south? I could go. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, meta science learn from um, what has been happening in the development space right now. Um, in that, concentrating more on the global north and later coming to the global south, um, 
has its own costs. And I think uh, for uh, meta science methodologies to be well adapted to the global south, there's, there's need to be more efforts to contextualize this and test them in the global south. You know, more efforts should be uh, put in place uh, to do whatever is happening in the global north, in the global south simultaneously, and trying to um, test these uh, methodologies across all regions uh, because uh, we, we can see what's happening in the development um, space right now. Um, theories were developed in the global north and now it's taking like more efforts to try and um, uh, implement them in the global south. So if the, the issue of evidence generation for meta science research could happen simultaneously across all regions, that could, yeah, get somewhere in terms of like making sure that they're applicable um, in many, many areas and spaces. Thanks so much, Joel. Um, so uh, to try to bring this to a wrap, um, we've covered a, really a lot of ground. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, where meta science is, uh, obviously meta science has focused a lot on open science and reproducibility, and those topics uh, are relevant to development research. Um, and uh, development research could potentially benefit from uh, those kinds of focuses. Nakabiana, for example, mentioned how just the access to articles can be a, a great hindrance to um, you know knowing what the evidence is in order to build on it. Um, but um, I, I think also uh, things like open data and um, pre-registration, although we didn't talk about them in detail in the in the panel those could be um, applicable as well. Um, however, one of the big blind spots of uh, meta science um, is the issue of generalizability and everything that lies behind it. Um, and that's a topic that has been a focus, although um, maybe there's more to go in um, development research. And um, uh, Tara mentions this Medicata initiative. That's one example. Um, in, in general, there's some um, uh, there seems to be a greater appreciation for um, both um, how findings might not generalize, but also generally the role of context and how it plays all of these different roles in the evidence generation process. Um, even um, It can even affect whether the measures that you're using are meaningful at all. Um, and we also covered um, uh, the uh, evidence to policy pipeline and how there are many factors involved in whether evidence is used at all, um, in, including trust. And I, Nakabiana, I think you had a lot of insightful comments about the role of trust in particular in relationships with policymakers. And perhaps meta science could play a role in understanding that, that pipeline a little bit better. Um, and finally, we talked a, a lot about uh, issues around um, the global north and global south, including power differences and um, some ethical problems that can happen with um, uh, research that is that is not thoughtful. Um, and um, I, I think all of these could be our, our fruitful areas of um, intersection and in places where um, meta science and, and uh, development could benefit from each other. So I, I just want to uh, thank the panelists so much for um, your patience and for um, uh, tolerating my little pet interest. And I, I hope this pet interest can be not a pet interest anymore, but um, something that um, uh, more people find interesting too, and, and something that where um, there is this uh, fruitful intersection between the two areas. Um, so uh, uh, thanks so much. And I think Jason, you had like one small pitch to, to give maybe. <laughs> Oh, yes, I, I am a member of the, the Association for Interdisciplinary Meta Research and Open Science, formerly um, on the board and president of it. And we have a, our own conference coming up in November in Brisbane. So yeah, keep an eye out for that. Similar stuff to this conference. Yeah, thanks, Jason. And actually, Joel and I, um, I think we referenced a keynote um, that we gave at that conference, which is online and on similar topics. So if you're interested in this, um, do look that up. Um, 
So uh, thanks everyone. Thanks for um, your patience and, and for your attention over this hour and a half. That's a, a long period of time. I hope you found this interesting. Um, and um, uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>